Now, I want to know what Robert Jackson had for breakfast. And I want to do two things with what he had for breakfast. I don't want him to have it on stated council meeting days, because I don't know what I'll do with all that energy bursting around City Hall, but I want to package it so when we need it, we all can take it in pill form and be that energetic. But thank you very much, Robert. Uh, I came in the door and you just said, and we kicked the state's butt, and I thought I have nothing really left to say now that Robert has said it. But uh, I want to thank Darlene very much for emceeing and being with us this morning, Mindy and the whole team at Learning Leaders for their great work. I also really want to thank Diane Billings Burford, Burford, who is our chief service officer who's with us, and I think she has helped learning leaders go to even greater levels, but most significantly has helped engage New Yorkers, whatever their interest is, in service. We saw it on our Mother Teresa Day of Service. We saw it over the weekend when there was the storm and folks were out there helping, and it is just a great message about what it means to be a New Yorker. So thank you very much for your great work. But most importantly, thank all of you for taking you know, time out of your incredibly busy schedules to be learning, leading, le learning leaders, <laughs> volunteers. And I just want to say to the 10% of you who are men, thank you. To the 90% of you who are women, I have nothing to say. It says it all. And not for nothing, the 90% of you are women, have jobs, are taking care of your children, doing four times more of the housework still than your partners. I'm just saying. I'm not saying. You know what I'm saying? But thank you. But you know, Robert talked a lot about the significance of education and his household. And I, I often uh, tell a story that I want to share about how I ended up in this position. You know, people ask me, did you always want to be an elected official? And I didn't always want to be an elected official. Actually, there was a long period of time when I didn't want to be an elected official because I thought you were more effective if you were an organizer who affected five or ten votes than just being one vote. But I always wanted to work in politics and government. It was the only thing I ever wanted to do. My father used to call it my curse because I knew so clearly and wasn't willing to consider anything else. I realized that this world of politics and government and social change existed because of the library at St. Patrick's Elementary School in Glen Cove, where I went to elementary school. I can see it like it was yesterday. The rack in the right-hand corner of the library where the biographies were. And I read every biography of a famous woman, of a political leader. I read them over and over again. What you all do by making our schools function, by making our libraries work, which often don't get, for example, get the attention they should, you make sure that other young girls and boys have the opportunity to experience things they may not see in their house or in their neighborhoods. And by doing that, you open up a world of options for them that you have no idea how impactful that could be on our city and world. And that is an amazing thing. Because some of you are doing it for your own children, but you're also doing it every day for children you may never see again at the end of the school year. You may not know at all. And that is a level of selflessness that to me is so significant. And I am so grateful we have that in, that in our city and so grateful to know there is this type of support to help other young girls and boys find their dream within our school buildings. You know, we have right now in New York City 1.6 million people who are over high school graduation age, who don't have a high school diploma or a GED. How are we gonna get that number down? How are we gonna make sure it doesn't grow? Well, look to your left and your right. You're the answer to that. By making our schools function better, we will make sure that the children who could make that 1.6 number be even bigger stay in schools and finish it. There is nothing, in my opinion, more helpful to people achieving their dreams, getting out of poverty, going to the next level, having lives that are full and happy 
than the best education possible. All of you make that a reality, and most importantly, you move us closer to that being a reality in every neighborhood in our city. Because we will really be the best city we can be when it doesn't matter when you walk out of your apartment or your house, what street you live on, what borough you're in, how much money is on that block, if then when you walk to your school, it is the same quality as the school in the richest neighborhood in our city. That's a hard goal, but all of you believe in that goal, and if we believe in a goal, I really, truly, and honestly believe what we can get there. So thank you guys so very much for being here. You know, in the ads for the new, uh, you know, Wall Street Gordon Gecko movie, you know, with uh, Michael Douglas, he says, Michael Douglas, Gordon Gecko, uh, that he used to think in the first movie that the most important thing in the world was money. And now he knows that the most, having been in jail, uh, that the most important commodity in the world is actually time. You guys know that too. And of the short amount of t extra time you have in your lives, you take it and you give it to our school children and our public schools. His, this fake character is actually right. It is our scarcest and most precious commodity, and I thank all of you for being so selfish that you give it to our school children in our city. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Christine. I need Christine to come over and help me get my nine-year-old to read one book. Anybody, just one book without a big fight every night. I'd now like to welcome a gentleman who's responsible for the education and development of over 700 school children in the Bronx, Please welcome the principal of PS55, Mr. Luis Torres. Good morning. That's good. I'm not going to do it twice. And I'm also proud to be part of the 10% that is of the males that are here today. <laughs> but um, I come to you not as the principal of PS55, but I come to you as a parent, a product of public school, and also as the new principal of learning leaders, as I was told I am now. But I come to you as a young Puerto Rican man who grew up in the Bronx, attended schools that probably looked just like the schools you, you work in every day. And if there was a learning leaders program back when I was going to school, my mother would have been a learning leader. Growing up was not easy, believe me. But it was easy because my parents were involved in my education. And we all know that in a lot of our schools, our kids don't have the same supports. And what I tell my staff is that you have to be the foster parent for those children. The volunteers in my building, they serve as the parents for the kids. My boys who don't have that male role model, I give them a male role model. And that is my job. For too long, we allow things to just go along and nothing happened. I said, you know what? I'm gonna be a principal because there needs to be change. The school that I serve is five minutes away from where I grew up. And I tell you that the difference between good schools and great schools are the people in this room. The best schools are the schools that have people committed to the school that are not paid. That's what makes the difference. Because to me, if you're in the school not paid, you're telling me that you're there because you have the heart and everything it takes to make a difference in the child's lives. And that to me is more than any paycheck I can give you. You could clap, you can clap. Now I talk a lot, but I, my time is limited as I know, but I wanna make sure I hit some key things. Now I'm a principal, but I'm also a community leader. 
I'm currently working with Montefiore Clinic to put 10 health clinics in the schools. Because, you could clap. In different schools, because for some reason, the, the community I served, the, the, the last clinic was converted into a shelter. And I know we need housing, but we also need health care for our kids. Now, if it wasn't for the parents in my community supporting me, I would just be a crazy principal. You could call me Joe Clark. <laughs> but you know what? The parents have my back. And just a couple of minutes ago, I had one of my parents here, Samantha, come over to me and say, Mr. Torres, are you mad? I said, why? Because I made a big deal because the gate was not open on time. And I said to Samantha, I said, Samantha, why would I be mad about that? Actually, I encourage you to, to, to be loud and to, to voice your concerns because that's the only way we can make change. Now, one of the things that I'm doing with the learning leaders is I'm going to open my doors to learning leaders, and I would like to be a model school for other principals. I really believe in learning leaders, and it's not because I'm getting paid by learning leaders, but it's because I truly believe that the difference between good schools and great schools are the volunteers that work every day in those buildings. Just another thing, to, today, before I came here through the traffic, I had a conversation with my, one of my learning leaders. I told her, I have a new job for you. I had to lay somebody off who used to pick up my kids from, to, to bring them down to the Montefiore Clinic, and I need you to replace that person for me. And she said, Mr. Torres, anything we need to do for the children of the school. I'm not paying her but she's doing it from her heart. And the last thing, because I know my time is short and I love to talk, as school leaders, we have to match the needs of our community, the needs of our community with the resources we have in our buildings. If you have a bilingual program in your school that only serves the Spanish-speaking parents, and your population is growing with African parents. We have to make a change. We have to figure out how do we match the resources in school. So for example, in our school, my African population is booming. And I'm Hispanic and I'm Spanish. But I'm not gonna hold on to programs in my school if it's really not making a difference in the community. So you're free to come over to my school on any given Saturday, starting in two Saturdays from now, and you'll see my African parents learning English while their babies are being taken care of. And the last thing, I'm Christian, I grew up Christian, but I had to go into a mosque because I had to make that move for my children. So I went to speak in the mosque and I told the Iman, I said, you know what? Your boys are out of control. Your boys are out of control. The Iman came to my school every single month and made sure that those kids were behaving the same way they behave in the mosque. And you know what? If it takes us going into these communities, takes us going to whatever church, no matter where they are, we have to do it for these children because we're not gonna lose any children. So I thank you.